Hello guys and welcome to today's video. I'm very excited to do this. I had the privilege of meeting John Conyard at the recent Platea 2500 anniversary and he is one of the most knowledgeable people ever, I think. He uh, is a cavalryman, he does many years of reenactment and uh, I'll let him introduce himself. My name's John Conyard, I'm chair of the reconstruction group Comitatus. Uh, we're known for our reconstructions of the late Roman period, especially late Roman cavalry, but we reconstruct the entire Roman period. Uh, we also moved into Greeks, and I'm very interested in Greek and Hellenistic warfare, uh, the reconstruction of artifacts. I'm afraid really it's all about reconstruction. All right. uh, what got you into sort of the world of reenactment and your love for history? Um, I'm very proud to be Cornish. Once a year I used to go and watch the Sild Knot uh, reenact the English Civil War Battle of Stratton in North Cornwall. Uh, this is when I was a child and when I got a job and some money I wanted to be part of it. So I joined the Sild Knot back in the 80s. Um, when I moved up to York I found there was a whole wonderful world of reenactment. The Vikings, the medieval period that I could take part in. In fact there was almost a society for every period. When I was reconstructing Viking and Saxon bone work and board work, people were polite. But when I started taking an interest in the Roman period, then academics started being interested and I um, became a research associate for the University of Kent based down in Canterbury. Um, so for me, it's all about how things are made, how things are repaired, the materials used. So um, uh, I think back in the early 2000s some academics came up for a threefold classification of reenactment and they said that the so the first stage was the level of battle reenactment and tour guide where people were using largely blunt weapons and quite often really just um dressing up fancy dress almost um and that could fire the public's imagination and get them interested in the period. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Um, and it's certainly exciting and interesting to do, and I do it sometimes. Um, but it doesn't add anything to the overall level of knowledge we have. Mm -hmm. The second stage probably covered the vast majority of Roman reenactors. They carry sharp weapons, they're interested in accurate reproductions, even interested in getting the metallurgy right, but they don't publish anything. So there's almost a wealth of knowledge there that people don't get to see. And then the third classification is people that try to get their work published. So obviously I'd like to count myself in the third um, category. Um, there's nothing wrong with any of it. I think uh, Greek reenactment and reconstruction perhaps is hovering around the first classification at the moment. Mm -hmm. Hopefully it's going to move into the second and third in time. Yes. All right, so moving on to the Greeks, when do we sort of see the first use of cavalry in antiquity? Um, I think people have been falling off horses for quite some time. Um, the, the horses might have been used to pull carts and chariots and you might have sat on them. Um, both legs down one side of the horse. Uh, you might have sat on the horse well back uh, on its backside in a sort of chair seat, something that Xenophon criticizes. But I think your question really is about the effective use of cavalry, and that's going to come from the steppe peoples. So let's call them the Scythians, and all the different confederations, and the steppe tribes, the Persians, of course, will be one. And they're using their horses not just on the steppe, but seemingly to run day trips around even Egypt and other parts of the Middle East as well. So really, like so many things, saddles, um, good accurate horse tack, it's all going to come from the steppe, first of all. So quite early on in sort of the development of warfare as well, we sort of see mounted, mounted people. I mean, I think people have been throwing stones at each other for some time. It takes them a little while, well, it takes horses a little while to develop. And then we need to develop the tack to get on the horse and not fall off it and control mm, it. And, and there's, a, there's a common sort of statement going around now that uh, the knights rode ponies, which is a little bit misleading. But do we actually know sort of the rough size of ancient horses? Um, Johnson did a study of... Uh, equine bones found in the Roman Empire that suggested that the average side of horses in Britain would be 13 hands too. Uh, in the rest of the empire, 14 hands. So that's relatively small. When it comes to looking at Greek horses, we've really got iconography to go on, but those artists might be using artistic license and it depends on the size of the vase they've got to paint their mm -hmm. horse on. Um, there's a certain amount of skeletal evidence um, hard archaeological evidence from the ground. 
and we can combine the two to suggest that they're riding horses maybe of 11 hands up to 14 hands. Obviously, the Persians have access to much larger horses. And, and when we see cavalry as well, especially during the Persian times, was it just horses or would they sometimes ride other animals? Oh, um, believe me, if you can sit on it and use it for war, if it's intelligent enough or arguably stupid enough to be ridden at the opposition, you can use it. So they're certainly riding camels and elephants. And, the Finns are riding reindeer, and if you could ever train a, a cow to go into action, its skin, its hide is much thicker than a horse, it'd be much harder to kill, but it wouldn't be as fast. So, yes, animals you're going to use, but there needs to be a purpose mm -hmm. for it. So a horse is relatively fast, it makes you a hard target, you can move around the battlefield quickly, you can use more than one, you can have remounts, it can carry a reasonable amount of weight, uh, if it's got a nice broad back um, with a nice recessed spine, it makes for a relatively stable weapons platform. Right. And, and how do we know how commonly used they would have been by the Greeks and the Persians compared to infantry? Um, I think because the Persians were at one stage a steppe tribe, and they're certainly fighting other steppe tribes, for them, cavalry is relatively straightforward. Um, their tack, their equipment, their knowledge of horses, the fact they're using stud farms, that all suggests they're at a relatively high standard of horsemanship. The Greeks sometimes, I feel, are riders, not horsemen. Um, Xenophon certainly seems to be writing his book to encourage his friends to use horses and understand them better. The fact that he has to reassure them that riding a horse downhill won't dislocate its shoulders suggests that their knowledge is at quite a basic level. And I suspect the things he recommends on his books on horsemanship, really, he's actually copying from what he's seen in Persia. Mm. So a horse would be a very expensive item for the Greeks. If you're cavalry class, you're roughly twice as wealthy as a hoplite. Um, in most cities, that means you can vote and stand in elections. You'll be running your city. If you're not running yours, you're going to be running somebody else's. They are the social elite. So that's really interesting, because when we usually talk about the upper class tier in ancient society, or ancient Greek society, usually we're talking about hoplites. But so the sort of like upper, upper class would be you're wealthy enough to afford a horse and you can ride it, is that? That's right, and I mean, they would just be called the knights. So think of the bodyguard of the kings of Sparta or the elite in Athens or any other city. Um, but the horse is very expensive, so if you can afford a horse, <laughs> which is gonna cost a bit. So say an average horse, 500 drachmas, I think Xenophon's over 1,500. Um, you don't want that horse killed mm -hmm. in action, so you're going to try to keep it safe, you're going to be throwing javelins from it, you're going to be trying to keep your distance from the enemy, and you might not fight on foot at all. Um, it just might be a social position, and then you go and fight on foot and keep your horse somewhere safe. Um, Taxation is pretty sketchy in classical Greece, but you would be asked to buy things for the city, such as a gymnasium or pay for a play to be put on, but the first thing you normally have to pay for is a horse. You have to buy a horse for the city and now you ride to war. You are cavalry class. So I think when most people look at hoplites and they see all the military equipment and the armor and the helmets and they see them as a very high status warrior, on my horse I'm looking down at somebody who's probably got half my income and is just a little bit better than a plebber, really. <laughs> and uh, and when we um, also, because like, I believe English knights were famous for dismounting before warfare, so is it likely that perhaps they weren't really used as shock cavalry, they were more used either by missile troops or as just a status moving around to um, battlefields? Um, cavalry changes role through time, and that role is probably dictated by the society um, that's using it. So, for instance, the Greeks, missile troops, uh, Macedonians, Thessalians, um, they live in castles, they have a very different idea. They've almost got a knightly class. Um, the Macedonian cavalry, Thessalian cavalry are very hard men. They will charge into you and they probably have enough horses to <laughs> not mind if a few get killed in action. When it comes to Saxons, 1066, etc., they will ride to war, dismount and fight on foot. Obviously, the Normans will fight mounted. Um, some people will say that the stirrup gives you an advantage and you can start fighting mounted when you have the stirrup. I don't believe that. Obviously, you can fight mounted without a stirrup. A stirrup gives you a certain amount of lateral stability, but horses are gradually getting slightly larger through time. So by the time we get to, say, the end of the Wars of the Roses, 
the horses are going to be marginally larger, maybe 15 hands, certainly larger than in the classical period. Um, they're going to be able to bear weight. And uh, obviously in Northern Europe, the issues of heat, um, the amount of water the horse needs to take on, isn't as important. Mm-hmm. And well, you mentioned stirrups there. Do we have much evidence supporting the use of stirrups or saddles or any special types? Stirrups, um, not in the Greek period, not in the Roman period, slightly after the Roman period, you might have a, a piece of rope, and that piece of rope might have a wooden tread on it. Um, there's absolutely nothing to stop you using uh, a piece of rope with a loop on one end. You, you, you loop it around the front two horns of your Roman saddle to get on it, but there are lots and lots of ways of mounting a horse. That's just one of them. Um, when it comes to saddles, uh, um, you kind of need a horse which has a recessed backbone. Uh, there are two layers of muscle down a horse's spine, either side of the spine. And ideally, you sit on those two pads of muscle. Um, so you're raised above the spine. If you sit on the spine, that's going to be quite uncomfortable. The mount that I was using at Platea, for instance, had a very bony spine that I was sitting on, and it was uncomfortable. Um, so Senefon says if you do have a horse of a bony spine, you need to use some sort of felt padding to make it more comfortable for yourself and the horse. The simplest thing to do is to roll up, um, say, two rolls of felt and then tie it either side of the spine, tie them together, drape them either side of the spine, and then maybe hold them there with a simple girth. And if I do that, I've just invented a Scythian saddle. So that raises me up above the spine, makes it more comfortable. Um, You could just throw a saddle cloth over the horse to keep yourself cleaner because obviously horse sweat and dirt and riding bareback is an issue. Um, At Platea, I sort of seem to develop a two-trouser technique where I'll be wearing smart but relatively tight trousers and then I put a loose pair of trousers over the top. They'll take all the muck and I can strip them off in the evening and be smart for parties. Um, It's a very Napoleonic idea. Um, uh, The thing is when you start covering up the horse you don't have that contact with it so if i'm going to be riding a strange horse on rocky ground um, i want to feel what the horse is doing so i want to have full contact with the horse so i'll strip everything off the horse to start off with Um, before a horse bolts or does something unusual you're going to feel its muscles clench and it just gives you that split second warning Um, when i get used to the horse (laughs) and when the sheer pain of the spine drives me to it then i'll start putting on saddle blankets and Mm -hmm. extra padding just for comfort so they're kind of like padded seats as opposed to full um developed saddles for like joust or something like that yeah the greeks aren't jousting um and once again, that's a, very much a social construct, the whole idea of chivalry. There you're going to have a big war saddle. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're using your war saddle, but there isn't really any specialised jousting equipment really to the end of the 15th century. Um, so, for instance, I have a suit of armour, but I have a helmet for war, then I have a helmet for the joust. Theoretically, during the joust, I'm not allowed to be struck beneath the waist. So, really, I might not bother with any leg armour, but the armoured front of the saddle does give me considerable protection, as do the armoured stirrups. It's a different way of thinking. Right. And sort of when we look at the... But I I would also say that they're riding in a different way as Mm -hmm. well. So, um, riding bareback, obviously, you have contact with the upper leg, but you're loose beneath the knee. Um... You continue that style on with a Roman saddle, the four-horn saddle. People will think that you bring your legs up underneath the horns to hold on. You don't. That will give you cramp. You might do that if you're riding over difficult terrain or if you're jumping. But the idea is still to ride with a loose leg in a very relaxed fashion. But the saddle allows you to tie lots of things to it. You can carry more equipment. When they start using stirrups, they're still riding with a very, very straight leg. So your backside stays in contact with the saddle. So if you were trotting, you'd be bouncing around. Uh, The British Army still rides like that on parade today. But we can see how after the Napoleonic Wars, maybe with the popularity of fox hunting, certainly in Britain, people start shortening the stirrup. um, And they will stand in their stirrups above the horse and let the horse move under them. And that's a very sort of Hungarian step way of riding again that they're doing. Once again, they're not knights. It's... That's not their social idea. They're horse archers. Uh, If you can raise yourself above the horse, uh, it's almost stabilising the bow and arrow, so it makes it easier to aim. Um, When your backside's firmly stuck on the horse as a Greek or Scythian archer, 
you've got to wait for the horse's highest point in its motion before you release the arrow. So it's um, it can sound a bit sun-like almost. It, it's not a matter of skill, it's just a matter of practice, but you've got just to wait for that perfect moment to release mm-hmm. the arrow. Yeah, so it, it, mounted archery is sort of like a, a different skill to foot archery. There's a lot more uh, skill involved in that, or is it similar? I think when it comes to reenactment, um, there are skills that stand people in good stead. So being able to light a fire, archery especially, is a good skill to use. Because you don't want to just dress up in the equipment. You want to be able to use it. You want to be able to make it, repair it, use it. You want to make sure that your equipment's fit for purpose. Um, When you start doing all of that on a horse, then it's a a different level again, um, because the wear on the equipment's gonna be much higher. And obviously, the skill of horse archery, bareback horse archery, many people would see as perhaps the hardest thing that they'd have to do in terms of reenactment on the back of the horse. Um, once again, there's no actual perhaps skill in it, just lots and lots of practice um, and application. I think people either come to riding in reenactment because they can either use weapons, they've done reenactment on foot and they'd like to do it on horseback, or they can ride in which case they need to be taught how to use the weapons. So people come to it from those two directions. Obviously, you've got to be able to ride the horse first. Mm-hmm. Um, Pretty important. So, um, yeah. So never bother taking a shot if the horse is not in the right position or it's not in... Yeah, just don't. It just looks bad. So you've got to be able to ride first and then use your weapons. And uh, and just going back to, you mentioned sort of equipment, like in medieval times, you're not supposed to be hit below the waist. Do we know for much, like, would the armour be different for a, mounted, um, for a mounted soldier as opposed to a footman in the classical age? Uh, yes. So we can see pictures of um, hoplites and cavalrymen wearing what we call the tube and yoke. Um, it's a colloquial term, you know, the tube wraps around the body, the yoke goes over the shoulders. Um, if you're going to sit on a horse, really, that needs to be a lot higher. So the bottom of the arm will relate to your belly button because, in effect, you are sitting down, not standing up. So the armour has to be shorter in the body. The difficulty is we don't know how the tube and yoke was constructed. Peter Connolly, a long time ago, suggested the idea of layers of linen glued together. Um, it's been suggested that it could be leather. Peter Head came up with the idea many, many years ago, um, a war gamer, war games research group, he um, did a book on the armies and enemies of classical Greece, suggesting it could be made of leather or indeed linen. We just don't know. We still don't know to this day. Uh, some people suggest it could be alum tanned, which is a form of mineral tanning, something very, very hard to do in the Greek world. And it wasn't common really until the 17th century when people invented machines to split hides to an even thickness and then slamming machines to slam the oil into the hide to produce the famous buff leather that was so common in the 17th century. Um, But if you soak vegetable tanned leather, which is relatively cheap compared to linen, if you soak it in cheese and water or milk, you can actually get the leather to naturally glue together by pressing it together, you can laminate it. Obviously, when you've made the laminated sheets, they tend to delaminate on the edges, so you need to over-sew them with leather just to hold them together. And that certainly produces the patterns we see on tube and yoke armors Mm -hmm. in iconography. But there's no guarantee that any of these ideas are actually what was done. So, in some ways, it seems easier just to make uh, a muscled um, torso armor. Um, copy the Greek armor that way, but that's a very, very expensive armor. Um, lots and lots of repousse work. Um, there's crystals in any metal. When you hammer them, you align those crystals, you make them harder. So all of that lovely repousse work on the Greek armor isn't just decoration. That wonderful six pack it gives you is actually hammered into it to harden the armor. And I suspect it was a lot thicker on the front than it was on the back. It would correspond to the different thicknesses we find on helmet. It protects you where it needs to. So I would say that it's far better if you can afford it to get a a muscled armor uh, in copper alloy. But of course, the difficulty is we cannot reproduce their alloys. Mm -hmm. Um, They're using roughly 90% copper to 10% uh, tin with lots of other elements mixed in there as well, I suspect largely by accident. Um, Around the end of the Roman Republic, they start adding zinc to produce a very sort of yellow 
brassy colour. Um, that's certainly done in the western part of Europe, not so much the eastern part. I'm talking in generalisations here. And sinkage, the Roman Republic or the Roman state soon gets a monopoly on it. But the idea of adding sink is actually a very, very old one. I think they were doing it in the Bronze Age to sort of reproduce almost a fake gold. Um, so people argue over the best alloy to use for Greek armours. Um, my armour's constructed from casting bronze, the sort of bronze we use for bells. It, I think it has a good authentic colour, um, but I don't believe it's the same hardness as uh, Greek armour. And certainly it all goes to pop when you consider the size of the human body today, because we're just much larger people. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one of my problems is I would like to use accurately sized horses, but we're larger people and I don't want to damage a horse's back. So I need riders that are quite small and they need to be quite fit. Um, you really need to get a body that physically fits the horse if you can. So because we're so much larger, um, my cuirass is based on an example from the British Museum. We know how large it is, how thick it is. We know the weight, about 2.5 kilograms. I think mine comes in about 4.6 kilograms. I'm just a larger person. The armor needs to be larger, therefore it's almost twice as heavy. So really, when it comes to reconstructing armor, uh, we're not doing so well in the Greek period. Yeah, it's a, it's a... Um, but we're safer on weapons. Um, and certainly at Plataea, I was very keen for all the riders to be carrying sharp weapons, different types of weapon. Uh, we can see their length, we can see their weight, so that gives us some objective evidence. Um, obviously, when we look at hoplites, you can question their armour, their helmets. I suspect there's some very nice helmets there. I suspect the majority were very average off-the-shelf helmets. And, of course, people were carrying foam spears for safety, um, not unlike weapons we might use for LARP. Um, I think if the weapons had been full size, full weight, sharp on both ends, people would have moved in a different way, fought in a different way, concentrated Definitely. in a different way. Um, that, that would have you know, got us some useful evidence, and maybe that can come in the future. But I think the experiments done at Plataea, um, I hesitate to use the word experiment because obviously Roman reenactment has a long history of experimentation. I think the Greeks, we are not exactly yet there yet um, to carry out an experiment. The first stage would always be to use authentic equipment and, and obviously we're not yet. Um, but I think the experiments were more around the mass movement of people. Yes. So people reconstructing the six basic factors in every drill, um, something quite familiar to Roman groups. So people are practicing their spacings, their facings, their wheelings, their doublings, their counter marchings. Um, and once they've got all that right, then they can actually look at the force generated by pushing against each other. But uh, I mean, this is a form of small scale battle reenactment. I suspect many of us there have been in quite large scale battle reenactments of over a thousand spears and shields. and. Um, you know, I don't really think the Greeks would necessarily fight in the way we no, would. No, yeah, it's um, a very lots of. I was talking to with Pablo about it before, and um, I think th I think the biggest evidence we have for the Orthismos is the fact that the shield um, like doesn't crush you. Um, but I just don't see why you would choose to fight that way when you have spears. I mean, I think there are. Uh other battle narratives uh, where people aren't using the hoplite shield uh, say at Hastings for instance where it was said the crush was so tight people were lifted off their feet they couldn't fall when they were dead we can see Romans at the Battle of Strasbourg probably using slightly convex shields or flat ones um, talking about the front rank being on their knees pushing uh, people were so close together once again they couldn't move so I think that kind of happens by accident mm -hmm. um, when two sides aren't backing down but uh, normally if somebody's going to present themselves as a target like that I think they'll be demolished quite quickly yeah I think one experiment I would have really liked to have tried is if we did an orthospos with the padded spears just to see how you could use a weapon as well as pushing at the same time so um, last year in this country, we had the Battle of a Thousand Spears, uh, a sort of Viking um, battle uh, organized for the birthday of the uh, Norse Film and Pageant Society, now the Viking Society. Um, we wouldn't close up and use spears and sorry, use shields in that close order there um, and push. And if you did, people would soon die. <laughs> Um, so just going back to, you mentioned battles there, do we have any like major victories that are essentially won by cavalry in the classical era? 
Um, I'm just concentrating on the Greek period here. Um, so Taya actually saw the largest use of Greek cavalry, um, and nearly all of it was fighting for the <laughs> Persians, and uh, it was successful on the Persian right. It uh, wiped out a mini group of Greek hoplites, um, and it re- I'm sure it retreated from the field in, in good order, since there would be nobody to chase it. Um, so, yes, we do. Um, there are other records of Athenian cavalry successes and obviously the Thessalians were famous for their cavalry and the Macedonians at the end of the classical period have a slightly different mindset there's absolutely no guarantee that Alexander was leading cavalry at the Battle of Chaeronea we always assume he is Um, he might have been Um, certainly it's one of those um, myths if you like one of those ideas about history that's caught on so the idea of him leading the charge to break the Theban secret band. Um, We always assume it's done on horseback. I don't believe there's any reference to that at the time. So references to successful cavalry actions in classical Greece are few, but they're there. You've just got to handle the cavalry properly. And uh, maybe the greatest defeat the Athenians in Syracuse was caused by the fact that they just lacked cavalry. And uh, I also believe in Plataea, when the Greeks' water supply got cut off, was that also not by Persian cavalry? Um, I suspect it would be all arms again. I think that when we sort of read battle narratives, we always kind of think cavalry by themselves, infantry by themselves. I would want infantry scouts operating with me to tell me where the gates are, how tall the walls are, how can I get through this open area, how many trees are there, what's the ground like? Um, I also think that we tend to think of skiffs wearing these clothes, Persians wearing these clothes, Greeks wearing these clothes and armour. I think there'll be quite a large intermixing. People wear what's effective on campaign. Uh, we kind of get get hung up on, um, I think, classifications, maybe produced by wargaming. Uh, I think uh, there'll be one or two ethnic markers. For instance, Greeks don't like trousers a great deal. But um, some of the Persian armour, very, very good. I think the Greeks would want to Mm -hmm. wear that. And indeed did. Alexander, of course, wore a Persian cuirass. So one thing that's actually commonly stated is that sort of the pike was a counter to cavalry. Um, And that sort of cavalry had a massive issue with long spears. So can we relate that to phalanxes? Or is that actually true? Or is that also more of a myth? Um... I think on a bad day, cavalry have a problem with bright colours, too much wind in the grass, things that jump out and surprise the horses. Uh, I think pikes are really, once again, down to the social organisation of Macedonia. Um, they don't have hoplites that are meant to be in the gym every day. I don't believe the hoplites were in the gym every day, but that idea of a hoplite soldier from a city-state, Macedonia doesn't have that. They have peasant farm boys. Um, and pikes work for them. They're organised in a different way, much deeper formations. So I think it's really the pike is a result of the society they're living in. The hoplite is a result of the society the Greeks are living in, in the same way that a horse archer is a result of the society the skiffs are living in. And uh, do we have any specific sort of cavalry formations that we see pop up regularly, or is it? another sort of blank spot in warfare oh no no um it's it's recorded how the Thessalians, i believe like the diamond formation the macedonians go for triangles you know the wedge um i think order is very very important so open order order close order if you're going to charge through something you want to be a close order knee to knee um i think if they're able to form their different formations that we read about on the move, that'll be very impressive. It hasn't really been attempted. Uh, on Hadrian's Wall for the anniversary, they put together um, some riders, but they could only form a formation at the walk, really, stationary. Um, but obviously the standard of horsemanship or the standard of rider, one would hope in the classical period, would be much better than we have today. They're doing it every day, their lives depend mm-hmm. on it. And throughout sort of the history of warfare, do we see an increase or decrease in the use of cavalry, or does it stay more static? Um, in the Hellenistic period, we hmm, at times we see an increase, uh, but then pikes seem to predominate again and the number of horsemen go down. Um, Romans obviously get federati or auxiliary horsemen to fulfil a need. 
So, in the classical period, I suppose by the time we get to the third century, Romans sometimes have all cavalry armies. Um, by the time we get to Forgetius and the fourth century and early fifth century, um, he can say that cavalry have reached a peak of perfection where a horseman can be a lancer and a horse archer at the same time. So he can, in effect, run away from a stronger enemy shooting to the rear against a weaker enemy. He can put his bow away and uh, unshoulder the lance, a uh, form of contos, um, so a heavier lance than the Macedonian version, and, and charge home. So really that, I believe, is the peak of ancient cavalry and uh, as writers at the time said once again it's not a skill it's a matter of practice so you have to ride with your shield and your bow and arrows um, and your contos and then when we uh, go back so I think a common misconception people have in the Greco-Persian wars is that it was Greeks fighting Persians whereas in reality there are actually more Greeks fighting for the Persians than against so do we know sort of how much cavalry was made up by actually Greek force as opposed to Persian force? Um, yes, we do. Can I tell you now off the top of my head? No, <laughs> I can't. Um, but also if I was a Persian commander, um, I think I would have used the Greek cavalry for scouting because they knew the ground, because they're probably on smaller horses. Um, you can wear them out. Um, <laughs> easier <laughs> um so you can use the horses probably for more jobs persian large horses like, like a platea i was going to use the large horses very carefully i wasn't going to put them over rocky ground we're just going to use them on flat areas where they could run the smaller horses yeah they were a little bit tougher um we could use them for a little bit more we could put more people on them right and then so that was something that i learned and obviously larger horses drink more and eat more um and they're going to have more effect up close face to face in the battle where they're going to suffer casualties so you kind of want to hold them back and and save them for the correct mm -hmm. occasion it's almost i suppose like french cuirassiers being uh, held back and they might have a squadron of lancers or light cavalry attacks attached to make sure the ground is suitable for the charge but you hold the cuirassier back to you need to uh, use them um, as a decisive weapon and do we see massive differences in the equipment to Persian cavalry as opposed to Greek cavalry, or is it again sort of more of an intermingled uh, sort of standard? I think that uh, the Persians would have had more interesting bits, more interesting tack, and the Greeks need to copy that. Uh, the Greeks need to, uh, I suppose, take Xenophon's advice um, and, and copy Persian practice. Um, I think the Persians would be a lot more at home on the back of a horse. Um, so that makes using the Greek cavalry for scouting and day-to-day -day jobs once again more <laughs> more sensual, using them up in effect, and you're keeping the Persians back for uh, the time that it matters. Um, so the Persians were superior cavalrymen. I think, I think you are right to emphasise the fact that more Greeks fought, or more Greek cavalry fought for the Persians than against. Um, I think that history is by its very nature revisionist and we ought to challenge it and we're learning things all the time. So we tend to see the Athenians as great democrats, even though of course they run a massive empire and they're actually massive imperialists. Um, when the Persians had entered Greece, they had already taken Greek cities. Uh, they'd stop them fighting against each other, they'd set borders, they'd set up a, far ta a fair taxation system that was so good the Athenians just took it over and continued to use it when those cities became part of their empire. And indeed the Persians had also introduced the idea of democracy into those cities. So you could almost see a world where the Persians had run Plataea, taken over Greece, allowed the Greek cities great autonomy, so the great thinkers and philosophers I think would have thrived there wouldn't have been any wars, or not as many wars. The Peloponnesian War, which was such a disaster for Greece and Athens, just might not have happened. And of course, rather than Athens being a democracy, there would have been far more democracies. And in return, the Greeks would have had to send a certain number of young men uh, to serve in the Persian army, and they would have seen the religions and the histories and the writings of the East um, which could have produced a massive flowering of civilization, And in fact, in many ways, perhaps the Persian defeat of Plataea is an absolute disaster. 
Um, I tentatively alluded to some of this in a speech at Plataea, and I remember a Greek historian saying, you are taking away my history, which is uh, always the cry of people when they're faced with an alternative yeah. um, set of facts, and they find it hard to take on board. So I suspect what we believe we know about Greek and Persian cavalry will be open to a certain amount of revision and revisionism over the next mm -hmm. 20 years. And some of that has got to be done by people reconstructing Greek and Persian cavalry. And it's really interesting to do it on the actual site of the battlefield of Plataea. The American school um, in Athens, just before the reenactment, did a series of lectures on Greek cavalry. And it was full of fantastic information up to the point of learning about the cavalry itself and what it would have been able to do and the speed of manoeuvre and the size of turning circles and what it was like to be a Greek cavalryman. Obviously, the information wasn't there, um, but reconstruction can help that. Um, I appreciate we're going to know 99% about what we know from Greek cavalry from history books, from the great historians, uh, a certain amount from archaeology and a very, very small part from reconstruction, but reconstruction plays a part. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to your point about the sort of what happened if the Persians won Plataea, I think there's, there's always two sides to history. And invariably, the very pop... At least. Yeah, at least. <laughs> at and, least uh, and I think invariably, there's always benefits, maybe not always, but there can always be benefits whichever way it went. And I do think that sometimes perhaps people... Um, like the Persians are very commonly portrayed as uh, like barbarians that sacked everything as opposed to they actually um, implemented lots of very good infrastructure and, uh, and advanced the Greek world a lot as well. And I think sometimes lots of people forget that sometimes just because they're invading, it doesn't mean that they're evil and destroy everything. They actually implement some stuff as well. I think there's a very long history um, of friction between east and west and it probably starts with the persian wars and uh, while i love herodotus um those classical writers are really aiming their work perhaps at an athenian audience and uh, obviously we shouldn't believe everything they say and we've got to view it with a critical eye um it always amuses me the way they make out Thessalians and spartans to be stupid um barely able to count unable to read and write i'm sure this gave the athenians a great laugh and a sense of superiority um but in a way it's really really sad that greece sort of became a a state where capitalism ruled and if you fell out with Athens, ships called democracy, freedom and liberty would turn up and destroy your city and kill all the men and sell the rest of you as slaves. And I suspect if I was living in modern day Iraq or the Middle East today, I would have some sympathy with that view that the Greeks weren't always the positive influence that uh, we like to imagine that mm -hmm. they were. Although they definitely did have lots of positive attributes as well. But I think sometimes people get too caught up on those and ignore the the not-so-good things that they did. Alright, so I think that's everything that I have. Thank you so much for spending your time to uh, to talk about this. I really appreciate that. Um, it's lovely catching up with you again. Um, I hope everything's going well and continues to. Uh, and yes, yeah, so thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, uh, it's been interesting talking to you. I hope I got over some of the ideas around reconstruction. I think that... Um, Obviously, iconography can give us so much. Historical authors can give us so much information. But then we've got to be able to interpret it. We've got to be able to add to the overall level of knowledge by reconstructing weapons and equipment and finding out how they were used. And obviously, that's the angle that I'm coming mm -hmm. from. Um, so I will emphasize that once again, just in case anybody missed it. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. Hey, guys. Editor Adam here. Um, thank you very much for watching this far to the end. I really appreciate that. If you'd like to support the channel more, I've actually launched a merch shop. The link will be in the description. All reenactment and history-based items. Thank you so much, and I'd really appreciate that.